CRs, please take the attendance. Okay. And uh, those who are standing, you can all sit down here. Yes, be comfortable. Take the attendance and then settle down. And just see if any, you know, latecomers are coming. You just see, ask them to come fast. If you can fix my laptop, we've got this other one in there. Dinesh, Dinesh, you want to check the sound? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use off my laptop rather than the one that's here. Okay, if that's okay, possible. Fine, fine. Otherwise, I can. Dinesh. He's a technical guy. He will help. Otherwise, I'll copy it across. No, and put no, it on no, there, no, no. He will, he will come soon. Come to the, the we have a lot of activity well. going on. We have. Uh, I go to. You, I was going on for the second year student examination. Yeah, so actually they are very busy, but uh, okay. I see nothing doing. You have to attend. It's a very good crowd. Good crowd. <laughs> good good yeah. Now, wh which um, which one do I go for here? Huh? Ah, dongle bull. Yeah, but brilliant. we can we can get started and then it's okay if it, it gets connected. Okay, but until that time you can talk. You know, <laughs> I'm more talk. than happy to. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fine. So let's, yeah. If if you want. Rajan. <laughs> yes, settle down. Let's start. I know you are. Busy currently with examinations and assignments. So thank you all for coming. It's our real pleasure. I am very happy to introduce to you two gentlemen who have come all the way from London. Professor Paul Springer. He's a writer and educator on innovation in digital communication. He has a lot of experience, have, has worked across the world. And today, he is going to talk about digital. And I'm also very excited, actually, to know. So I don't want to tell you all what exactly he's going to talk about. So we welcome Paul. And uh, also, we have Simon, who is the dean of ADI. Simon has completed his master's from Royal College of Art, and he has also worked across commercial, cultural, and artistic sectors. Both of them are associated with University of East London, which is a very prestigious university in the UK. And we already had the deputy vice chancellor of uh, the university visiting our campus a few weeks back few months back, actually. And uh, day before yesterday, we had the dean from the engineering side also coming. So we are very keen to have a close relationship, academic partnerships with uh, 
UEL. So now I would uh, request this Professor Rajan. Yes. Let's welcome Paul and Simon with a bouquet. <laughs> Just now we are starting with the session, so I would uh, expect you know little more silence. All CRs, you can settle down now. Now, please, you also enjoy the session, and whatever needs to be done, <laughs> we will do it. Please, Paul. Okay. Need a mic? Maybe. Can you hear me if I stand here and project? Or yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Paul, he's got a uh, mic. Thank you, that man. That's probably better. Yes, I can hear myself. Is it okay to switch the screens? Yeah. <laughs> no screen. It's the joy of using Please. technology. Um, the one thing I've learned about writing a lot about digital over the years is the more degrees of difficulty you build in, the more you rely on technology, um, the more degrees of risk you build into things as well. Um, great that we've got the screen working now. Um, thank you very much for entertaining us from, from the University of East London. Uh, we've got a, a rich history of working in, in different continents with different, different institutions. But I think the opportunity um, of working here is particularly profound because you happen to be the right age um, in the right country at the right time, if you're thinking of business, marketing, media in particular, because we're going through a period of huge, huge change. Not only the sense of migration to different parts of the world um, and in Asian, particularly Indian communities in Britain and in America are very strong, very strong identities. Um, so it's a, a culture that's been exported. Even in our, our daily paper in London, uh, we have a, a thing on every tube station in the morning called the Metro. There's even a section on that on Bollywood latest news in the gossip columns. Such is the impact now of, of Indian culture around the world. Um, but also, the chance of working um, with, with you guys is, is it's fantastic because we know we're, we're going to be working with the next generation of talent. And as somebody that's been writing and, and trying to make sense of the big changes in digital over the years. Um, many times, I've said this before, but if you really put your minds to it, you can do some amazing things. And I remember saying this to students years ago who now end up being parts of my talks because they've gone on to do some really amazing, profound, pioneering things in digital communications. And the area I'm going to be talking about today is um, advertising, marketing, search and social, and what those big pioneering moments have been. Because one of the few truths about, about the industries that we're, we're looking at now is that they always seem to be about the now and the next. They don't really seem to reflect on what's recently gone before, but they've left a really interesting uh, series of stories and trails that actually tell a rather interesting way in which digital communication has evolved. And I suppose the one truth, the one thing I probably want you to take away today is that um, digital 
communications, digital channels, social media, are still in their infancy right now. I'd say at least 99% of the potential is still to be discovered. And one of the reasons, I suppose, it's quite interesting in, in, in talking to you guys today, um, do you know, the, according to a, a recent survey, um, I won't give you the footnote because it's a, a, a nation source, but anyway, 17% um, of people on Google um, Google their own name to see you know, how many times they crop up. 17% globally. Do you know what percentage of Indian people Google themselves on a weekly basis? Throw some numbers at me. Go on. Very close. 34%. So in terms of a sense of self, personal brand, it's kind of interesting. And there's a difference between the image that people put out, how they put themselves on social networks and other things, and their identity, what you're known for. And there's, there's a, a distinction that's starting to emerge now. Image, pe things that people manufacture. Identity, what happens are in and around the image that you're projecting. And you'll see that one of the things that recurs to the things that I'm showing today, sometimes is the breakdown of image and identity. What you'd like everyone to know about you. And when they go on the net and start doing a little bit of research, what they really know about you. And when there starts to be a contradiction, that's when things start to go wrong. OK, um, a little bit about my story. Um, Years ago, I started teaching graphics and advertising students, and I realized that what they were doing, and then I went to advertising agents and saw what they were doing, it seemed a mile apart from what the books were saying at the time, because the books were talking about the great American Madison Avenue model. Did you ever have a TV series here called Mad Men? You do. It's not, not the sort of thing you get on ZTV, but um, if you ever seen Mad Men, it's kind of interesting. It's that kind of classic American business model that starts with Volkswagen adverts and kind of runs through the classic billboard, press, television uh, approach to advertising where the same agencies that created the adverts also had an agreement with the people who were manufacturing the billboards and then charged 15% commission for that. And this was a, a method that sort of ran from the 50s right through to the 1990s. And I thought it would be quite interesting to do my own PhD around that. And what I learned was the 1990s, it wasn't a case of a continuation but it was a period of massive change where, for the first time, you had brands with databases, with, with databases of customers. So they knew more about the customers than the agencies did. And they thought, well, hang on. Advertising is talking generally at lots of people, where we can now talk individually to our customers. We know when they want to repurchase things like cars. We know the sort of things that motivate them. We also know people have gone to showrooms and have showed an interest. So what's the point in talking to everybody generally when a very small part of that might actually mean anything to someone even thinking about buying a car? Where if we talk to the people who already own the cars, maybe we can get them to do the selling. So you used to get these amazing stories of, of brands like Land Rover having away days for Land Rover owners. So they go and tell other people who might be thinking of buying a 4x4, say, come and join Land Rover, it's like an exclusive club. Things like that started to happen. And then the era of digital happened. Now, when I was doing my PhD, um, I was writing about the big break in databases. But at the very, very end, that's when the internet started. And a whole new world of opportunities started opening up. And a whole new challenge to the existing advertising infrastructure started opening as well. And I realized it wasn't just advertising. It was also music industry. It was also sport. It was also anything else that involved sponsorship and branding became crucially under threat because the existing infrastructures didn't change. And one of the most interesting things I suppose I've learned from all this is that the very last people to change are the communications firms, the music firms themselves, because they have a vested interest in things staying exactly as they are. So I did a book about 50 case studies called Add to Icons, um, which at the time caused a bit of a ruckus because the existing agency structure didn't like it. It didn't have the great Guinness ads or the Volkswagen ad. But, but the younger agencies came out in support of it, which suddenly made it relevant and got me traveling to different countries. A few years later, I, I co-wrote a book with a guy called Mel Carson, who was head of, head of advertising at Microsoft in the States. Um, and this time, we just looked at 20 case studies of things that have been really innovative, um, like Google search. Whose idea was that then? What, what was the story of Google search? Twitter, what was the story behind Twitter? Um, Obama's campaign, what was the story there? iTunes. How did that come about um, when the music industry obviously liked things as they were? We started asking these really simple questions to start with, 
But when we went on the journey to find out who was behind it, was, was there any one person that was a real driver, we ended up hitting on a number of issues that kind of emerged that seem to be the main themes that go to this presentation, as you'll see. More recently, um, as the journey takes you, you, you end up meeting some interesting people and other opportunities open. Um, I've been working in the Middle East with uh, a big Saudi body to set up the Middle East's first college of communication. There's a little link of that in the middle of all this as well. But I think one of the biggest challenges at the moment is what's happening in China, and we're already starting to get a sense of that. And what's even the more uncertain market, and what's the bigger challenge right now, is what is happening here in India. So I think the journey is starting to get to a very interesting point, and it seems to involve you even better. Right. When I started going on the journey trying to find out what the benchmarks were, loads of companies started sending me different things to say, this is the best example ever. I had people sticking uh, Mentos mints in Coke bottles and making big fountains and saying, look, this has got millions of hits. I had people supergluing monitors to walls to advertise superglue to say, you can type things in real time on this monitor. Um, we had people with new technologies on iPhones, so when you poured it, it looks like drinks were pouring out. I was getting sent loads of different things for different reasons. Some of it was to show a new technology and how creativity could really make it work. Others were, were sending me things because thousands of people, millions of people had accessed it and, and tried to make sense of it. But then I got sent some really quirky stories as well. And actually, some of the quirky stories are possibly the most interesting. Things like this. A guy called Andrew in America who stuck his head on eBay as advertising space. You don't get anything more ludicrous than sticking your forehead as advertising space on eBay. But it was so unusual that the media started picking up on it and started writing about it. And suddenly, his head became a talking point across America. And people say, How much, who's going to buy that space? And because it became relevant space, and because lots of people started giving it attention, so suddenly, people were bidding a lot of money to advertise on his forehead. And eventually, he had, I think it was a three-month tattoo thing on his head, a snore stop, for something like fourteen to $16,000, I think he got for it. But what this kind of highlights is we're in a kind of a, a period of real pioneering, bizarre things happening at this time. Um, some people managed to make sense of it. Um, an amazing guy called Gurpa Shahal is, is one of the most interesting in all of this. Um, actually a Sikh guy from Pakistan originally, emigrated very early on uh, with his father, a postman, um, to Seattle. Um, he hated school because he felt very much out of culture in America. But what he was very good at, at the right time and the right age, was using the internet. So he started buying printers and selling them for more than he bought them for. And he thought, this is good. I wonder what else I could do. So he started exploring the internet, and he hit on this, what, what was one of the first ever click advertising sites called Value Click. It was original. Um, but nobody really got it. it. It did kind of well, but he thought they're missing a big trick here. So what he did, very simply, was he copied them. And he was only 14 years old, hadn't been to college, 14 years old. He just simply copied what they did, but made it simpler. And suddenly, within two or three years, more companies were going to, to his company, click agents, who were going to Value Click. Value Click were backed by um, their bigger holding group was Yahoo. So they said, what are we going to do about this company? We, we better buy him out. So as, as a, a 14, 15 year old, he managed to get something in the region of $3 million uh, to sell his company and to have a two year non-compete act. Which you know, can you imagine 14 years old, been told not to, to do any work on the internet and been given lots of money for it. You think, wow. Um, and I think the advantage for him, he, said, he always says, was being Sikh, because he wore a turban, he grew a beard, nobody knew how old he was. On the internet, he could get away with being anybody, so they always thought he was older. And he even invented other, other people who pretended were his marketing people. It was all him. Um, but anyway, in that two-year non-compete, the internet had moved on. So he started another company that was all about behavioral targeting, which was looking at data sets and predicting what people were going to do next. Again, it was about click advertising. But he really moved it on. And then he had to start employing people. Now, this took him into a whole different territory. By this time, he was, what, 17, 18 years old? Younger than you guys. Um, but he was going this, this big voyage of discovery, learning as he was going. But what he soon learned was that he thought he was going to conquer the world. But what he didn't do was own the data sets, the click-throughs. And people who owned the clicks, he said, were king. Googles, the Yahoos, those big internet service providers, Sohu in China were absolutely massive, because they knew what all the customers were doing. Therefore, um, 
he felt he was limited. So what did he do? He managed to sell his company for $300 million, again to Yahoo, for another two-year non-compete act, um, which brings him to pretty much where, where he got just a few years ago, not 1998, but 2008, um, to real-time advertising. And what's happening in advertising right now, and I, I guess you don't necessarily know this, but when you're clicking through, when you're looking at any content online, every decision you make, every click through, a personality view is being formed just based on your preferences, based on what you're doing, what you're clicking on, how you're moving. And that information is going to inform companies in different ways. You never quite know what they're going to do with the data. Radium One are quite interesting because they own huge data sets, but they never sell that data on. What they do is predict where you're going to go. Now, you say, great, sounds very interesting, very technical, but so what? The big so what is music firms like Universal and all the pop acts that they get utilize things like this. Have you ever heard of it? I don't think they've launched Jessie J over here. Have you heard of a singer called Jessie J? Yeah, okay, she's they're working here, right. Okay, every country, every new territory she's broken in, they look, at, they look at predictive data, they look at where the market's likely to be. And if you happen to be the right target group, the right age, who've gone for similar acts, you'll get a taster of her pop videos before anybody else. And you will be the early adopters. You will be the ones that sell that information on. Because they know word of mouth is the best way of selling, the best way of communicating. You get whole sports teams now organized around this. Team Sky, the cycling team, use Radium One to do their promotion. So sports, music, huge drivers of all this. Now, Gopal Shahal is a multimillionaire, and I said, if someone was to follow in your wake, what would you advise them to do? And his lesson is, is a pretty interesting one, really. He gets really annoyed by what he says, what he sees in the press about search and social. He says, social has come to mean anything on the internet. Sharing has become the most important signal, and no one's tapped into what you can do with data. He said, people just don't learn. You have companies trying to do what the original, way before you were born, but the dot-com, dot-bomb companies did back in about 2000, 2001. He said, with staggering valuations, but no idea how to make money. And the lesson he often puts out is that just because things are online, don't pretend it's any business like any, it's, it's not any other business. It's still a business, it's got to work in the same way. You've got to know who your clients are, you've got to know how you're going to make it work before you even begin to think about what the internet might be doing that's different. And he says, uh, makes the point, don't get carried away that because things are on the internet, it's different from any other business. Now, there have been some real game-changing moments in the history of digital. And this is kind of where it gets really interesting because they've been a little bit strange, to say the least. First of all, um, are you all familiar with Burger King's thing called subservient chicken? It was aimed at your age group, you should. Um, now, if you look at any marketing book about digital, they all hold this one up as being an absolute landmark, the best of its kind, 460 million hits nearly. In fact, it's also one of the biggest disasters. It nearly cost um, Crispin Porter, the agency, nearly cost them their clients for a number of reasons. First of all, originally the project was an afterthought. They did a TV commercial for $500,000 that was kind of alluding to the fact that um, you could have chicken in one part of America any way you want it. That was the actual message. That was the sole purpose of the commercial. Then one of the creative teams said, can we do something online? Because online's starting to happen now. It's getting exciting. And the client went, nah, OK, $50,000, $50, here you go. And what they did was they got a bit of paper, passed it around their office to say, right, come out with as many original ideas and suggestions for what you can get a chicken to do as possible. Can you imagine? Any number you like. So they passed this around for a week. And what they ended up with was no more than 250, because they said people's originality ran out at 250 ideas. They went through all the sexual things you could do with a chicken. They went through smoking a cigarette. They went through every type of dance, from moonwalking to walking like an Egyptian, to every single sort. But people's creativity ran out. And that was one of the first lessons they learned. The other thing about it, though, was that subservient chicken was called subservient chicken because it was supposed to be, as you can probably tell, a man in a chicken outfit dressed in suspenders. It was supposed to be a homage to the porn industry. Why the porn industry? Because one thing you don't see in many marketing books is that the porn industry has been one of the biggest drivers of internet creativity that you could imagine. 
The idea of downloading content anywhere, anytime, of monetizing it, comes from the porn industry. The idea of interaction, dialogue, real-time, making decisions as you go, that comes from the porn industry. And they were utilizing all those skills. So they're doing a homage, which in, in sense sounded great, but such was its appeal to young boys, mostly, that the internet went viral very quickly and went global very quickly. Now, the message was just aimed at America, not the globe. So if people actually understood what the message was in other parts of the world, if in Australia they went to Burger King and said, I want my chicken over easy, I want it the way I want it, they'd say, sorry, we don't do that here. So they got the wrong message. It was only ever meant for a tailored thing in America. It wasn't meant for a global audience. So first of all, they got their reach wrong. They overpitched to start with. Secondly, the client, Burger King, did not like to be associated with the porn industry. Can't possibly think why. Didn't like young boys, porn industry, advertising, global. Not where they wanted to be. So they threatened to, to sack their client. They threatened to sack their agency because they were taking them in the wrong direction. They wanted to completely reshape what they did. And it took the agency a lot of effort to convince the client to ride out the story arc and just to see where the journey would go. So in hindsight, everybody says what a great story it was. In practice, it was nearly a disaster and ultimately did cost them their clients. So you could either do things that are going to make you very famous or you try and do things that are going to be very effective. They're two different things. Um, and effectiveness, if you want to get more money long term from your clients, might be the better way to go. The other two big game changers here, very quickly. Bottom one, $500,000 budget for Mark Echo, who um, is a skater, surfer, counterculture figure, a bit like the artist Banksy in Britain. If anybody knew he went near an advertising agency, he'd lose all his young following because he's not seen as being mainstream. So what he did was he spent half a million dollars on a plane, sprayed it up to look like the president of the United States, his special plane, Air Force One, and then used a camcorder to film him climbing over a fence and graffitiing his tagline still free on it. Now, such was its impact. I mean, yes, 150 million hits is great, but also the White House had to have three separate press conferences to deny that it was real. The amount of press coverage it got was absolutely massive, and it was in exactly the tone of voice the counterculture, the spirit of irreverence that Mark Echo really needed for his brand. So one of the lessons from this was it proves that you can be countercultural, you can be alternative, you can talk to a very good target group if you think about the bigger strategy. And the creativity was in the strategy, not necessarily in the execution. The last one uh, was done by, at the time, two recent graduates who have gone on to do some amazing things um, for Emirates Airlines called Nonstop Fernando. Now, when you buy TV commercial space, you're paying a lot of money. In America, a normal ad spot, $500,000, say. When you buy that space on the internet, once you bought it, you don't have to keep on repaying on a daily basis. So they realized they had an opportunity to create the world's longest commercial, 14 hours and 40 minutes. And 14 hours and 40 minutes is the length of a flight from Sao Paulo to Dubai. So they managed to find a tour guide in Sao Paulo to talk non-stop for 14 hours and 40 minutes to explain why anybody would want to go to Sao Paulo in the first place. And the thing is, nobody but nobody, I challenge anybody in this room to sit there for 14 hours and 40 minutes and watch this. It'll cre you'll fall asleep, it's, it's painful. And the, the quality is not professional all the way through. But that's, that doesn't matter. What people do is they look at the beginning, they look at the end, they sample bits in the middle. They might go online to see other good bits to look at. But that's the, that's the thing of the internet. It shows that you can, you can watch things in a non-linear way. You can sample, you can move around, you can watch things out of sequence, because that's how people really consume things. Like when you get a magazine, you don't read it from page one to the last page. You flick to the leading articles, you look for the freebies in it, I've even seen some women on trains looking around when no one's looking and get the perfume strip and kind of wipe it to get a bit of the perfume scent on. You know, people do things in a very idiosyncratic way. And that's what happens with the net. And it's starting, just beginning to find its own form. And there are all these different thresholds that have really not been discovered yet. I just mentioned a few of the, the big challenges at the moment for them. Take music, for instance. This is an interesting guy called Denzel Fiegelson, who was in the music industry back in the 1980s. Um, he got moved by a, a pop musician called Paul Simon. He moved him to Los Angeles to manage a lot of African music bands. And what happened was he burnt out and got fed up. He got fed up of 
the pressure of trying to succeed with different bands around the world, but he also got fed up of being inundated with lots of young potential musicians sending their CDs, sending their tapes, wanting a break. Because when you see things like The X Factor, Arab Idol, or uh, what do they call it in, in this part of the world now? You have The Voice, don't you, here? Yeah? No. You don't have a poem called The Voice? No. Oh, you're going to be sold that one soon. Believe me, you'll be sick of it. Um, so do you have X Factor, Factor or Pop Idol? No. That's a superstar I think they have in Sri Lanka. Okay, the syndicated reality shows around the world that find talent. But they sow the illusion that anybody can make it, anybody can realize that dream, but so, so few people can. What happens though, usually in the music industry, is they have several artists, usually three they, three they invest in who are really, really talented in the same genre. And at the very last minute, they run with one and they just drop the other two. Now, Denzel Fiegelson hated that about the music industry because he saw people spending all their, their childhood growing up, sacrificing everything for a career that doesn't happen for no reason. And what he always liked the idea of was, was the internet being a democracy, a giving everybody a chance at least to develop their own talent and to develop their own following. So he had this idea of, of having a thing called Artists Without a Label. So if you couldn't get a record label, you could develop your own fan base and really start to grow it online. But the problem was, when he came up with the idea, the internet was too young. Loads of acts around the world came to him, but the internet site kept crashing all the time. So it got nowhere, so he dropped it. Quit the music industry, bought a farm in Hawaii with all his money, and retired. Then got bored, as anybody would who's a really good creative person. And he thought, well, what does this farm do anyway? And he realized the farm he bought in Hawaii was a flower farm. So he thought, well, the internet's a bit more developed now. Maybe I can sell the flowers online. So he started a company called Hannah Flowers. And um, he got a few of the people he happened to know from his industry days, like Oprah Winfrey and all the big pop musicians in LA. And he got them to do small endorsements for his flower store online. And within, what, the space of a few months, he had a multi-million dollar business on his hands. And he thought, wow, how quick the distribution is, how quick the network is now. If it could do that for flowers, could I go back and do that for music? And this is where luck comes into it, and a lot of luck came into it for him, because he happened to be in a part of the world where his reputation had grown for getting music legal clearances. And Steve Jobs at the time was doing lots of launches for Apple and was always wanting music clearance for the launch because he wanted to do launches in a different way. Big music event, booming music, dry ice, came out with a new gadget and showed it to everybody. Um, and he got Denzel Fiegelson, this guy, to do a lot of the music clearances for him. And he got to know Steve Jobs quite well. And Steve Jobs said, well, I'm working on this project, but I can't crack the music industry because the music industry think they want to carry on like they've always done. Like the moment young people start to go on the internet and download music for free, they want you to make them that to be criminals. It's piracy to download music. You shouldn't be doing it. It's illegal. Like that was going to stop anybody. And they were just trying to put up a wall and pretend that change wasn't happening, to pretend that you couldn't get music. They were still sending out CDs and selling them for the best part of 10 or $12. And they said, that's not a sustainable model. It's not going to work. So none of them were having conversations with Apple. Meanwhile, Apple has set up iTunes. You could upload your own music um, into iTunes. But they hadn't cracked the commercial bit. So they got Denzel Fiegelson to do it with them. And he helped negotiate uh, on the music industry's terms a reasonable way in which they might actually bring themselves into the digital age. They took some big losses. They had to start getting the, the 99 cent track. That was Denzel Fiegelson's idea. But it also opened the opportunity for a, a platform where people could start to sell their own music through it, as well as the big music acts. So because of Denzel Fiegelson, in, in Britain, we've had artists like um, the Arctic Monkeys, the Claxons, the Editors. It's a whole generation coming through who have to manage their own community. And it's true now that if you're really interested in music, if you can build up your own following by doing live gigs, if you can get about 10,000 followers online, then a record label will come to you and they'll really want to work with you. And it's the same with creative talent. If you go to YouTube and you get 10,000 hits for any film that you've done, they want to know you, especially if you're under the age of 25. That seems to be one of their thresholds at the moment. There's loads you can do. And Denzel Fiegerson will always say, it pays to be of the moment not ahead of time, because unless you can work with it, um, 
you're going to miss out a lot of things. But you have to really think about the potential of the internet. The idea of downloading music anytime, anywhere, we take for granted now. But before, you had to go all the way to a record shop and make a big experience of it. So now, you have to make a big experience of going online to do retail instead. And this seems to be the threshold. You've probably seen loads of versions of this, because when I end up working with ad agencies, this is one of the things we always seem to start with. At the moment, with the, with the internet, you've got the customer in the middle, you've got their personal domain, you've got their experience, because if you experience something, it has much more of an impact on you than just being told something. Then you've got the two-way dialogue, the one-way dialogue, when you're just told about things. And onto this, of course, you can map social media around customers, you can have, in terms of experience, you can have loyalty card schemes, all kinds. Then you can extend it to making experiences. But I guess this is the big issue at the moment. Have you all seen things like this, the Marshall McLuhan line of push and pull, of, of cold media and hot media? Now, usually when people talk about social media, they think about it in terms of it just being exclusive, in terms of there's no need for above the line. But the thing is, billboards, television commercials are essential. Because unless people know things actually exist in the first place, people will be none the wiser. So you need to know things that exist. You need to kind of engage with these. But selling things on television isn't going to make you buy anything anymore. TV commercials do not sell. They just remind you that things exist. Maybe if you see a chocolate commercial and you're going off to buy a chocolate bar, in terms of repertoire buying, you might think, well, I might go for that brand if it just happens to catch you. But for the most part, TV commercials just remind you things exist. Things that make you change your habits, bigger things, well, friends will do that. So if you have a mobile phone and your friends is better and gives you, you know, cheaper, uh, more access, more, more access to different things, maybe you might actually change your habits. But the big threat to all the major companies is this. The big expensive stuff, making people aware, that's bought and paid for. But the social media stuff about engagement, talking, you have to earn that before you can own it. And you have to be authentic, you have to be true, otherwise people get bored and move on very quickly. One of the best examples recently comes from Mumbai in all of this. This is where I'm going to need to see if we can get the internet going. Um, are you all familiar with the biggest independent agency here for advertising in Mumbai called Taproot? This is the first agency to win uh, global awards for its advertising. Well, I think you've got, is it 17 different uh, major dialects across India? And to actually locate and to really identify with different cultures, you need to be able to speak in their own vocabulary. It wouldn't work as a TV commercial. So what they did when they were trying to get Airtel to appeal to young people was to look at the habits that young people have that older people don't have. They have all their different types of friends. The friends you rely on when you're in trouble. The friends that rely on you when they're in trouble. Your friends to go shopping with. Your friends to go drinking with. Your friends to go to the cinema with. The friends that you can never really rely on. They mapped out all those different sorts. And then they just took eight of those different dialects and did shorter films that uh, were put out just on mobile phones. And if we can, I'll show you clips of both, um, and you'll see the difference. First of all, there's a TV clip. See if we can get it working. Are we hooked up to the net? Uh. My hunch is we might not be. Okay. While they're, while they're downloading it, it, it should be it should be an advert that you're all very familiar with. Um, but there's something that's rather clever in the way that things has been constructed. Um, because when you do a TV commercial, you're still, 
you, people you're targeting are one thing, but you're still not talking to a mass audience. If anyone's going to complain about a commercial, it's usually the people that the advert is not targeting. So they have to be incredibly measured. They have to be incredibly measured in uh, how they do things. But the moment you get things online, the moment you put things onto YouTube, the moment you're talking on social networks, you can talk in a much more direct way, and you can get away with local expressions, you can get away with the type of communications you could never do on a mass communication broadcast terrestrial channel. Um, as you'll see, if we can just show the clips. Okay, uh, I think it's going to take too long. Fortunately, it's going to take too long to show. Um, but I urge you, um, I'm not going to show it here. I urge you, do go onto YouTube, check Airtel Half Friend, look at the main commercial, then go down the right hand column and look at the, some of the smaller films that go with it. Um, and you'll see the difference in, in, in tones of voice. And that's why things like this are designed to drive you from a mainstream push advertising to something that's much more about pulling you closer to the brand, getting you more involved and more engaged. Okay. But the thing, I guess, with social media is that um, once, once you get people on, online, you can do a lot with them. But there's so many different social media channels that people don't know what to go for. And this is a real issue. Everybody feels comfortable with one or two platforms, but their friends might be on different channels. And working at a university where we've got lots of different creative industries, what I've discovered is that people have their own formats that suit them very well. So if, for instance, you're a journalist, you're a writer, you're into the news, you're more likely to be on Twitter. Because what you want is lots of information, short, succinct. If you're kind of social and quite chatty, you quite like the idea of being on Facebook because you can share things with your friends. And the problem for your generation is you often open Facebook accounts when you're very, very young and you can do lots of things, then you kind of go off it. And then when you kind of get older and you go to university for the first time, you kind of reopen your account again and you've still got the debris of all your old friends from many years ago and you think, oh, they're going to find all these things out about me. So you kind of reinvent yourself. And then you want to go for a, a job, so you go on to LinkedIn. 
So you invite future employers on to check you out on LinkedIn, and then they check you out on Facebook and find a completely different version of you out there. And how you organize that is quite a challenge now. Um, because, I mean, this, this, this thing illustrates it very well. Um, different platforms suit, suit different types of engagement. If you're a designer or an artist, if you're a textile designer particularly, you tend to use Instagram or you use Pinterest because you're visually led. You want to show people things. Um, if you like to travel and that's your virtue, then Foursquare is probably the one for you. But the thing is, you have to find the right platform to meet the right community. And part of the problem for brands is that people go onto their platforms because they want to socialize. They don't want to go and see companies selling them things in a hard way. So for instance, this, this was some research we did a, two or three years ago with a global firm um, about why people go to Facebook. They go to Facebook to stay in touch with friends. Um, they might want to change their opinions or talk things through. They do not want to go onto Facebook to make money. They do not want to go on Facebook um, to you know, be creative. It's very specific. And they certainly don't want to be sold to in that space. And this is, this is recent big, expensive pieces of communication using social media that have gone terribly wrong for brands. In Britain, this is Starbucks, the very famous coffee house, um, who went to an advertising agency, who do big media adverts, to do social media. And they did what they normally do. Rather than open a dialogue, they came out with lots of closed statements. So here's a nice picture of coffee, and the strap line was, coffee is our muse. Our muse. In other words, they celebrate, they enjoy coffee. And of course, people underneath make lots of comments, like, um, you know, coffee is your muse, but paying tax certainly isn't. They really had a go at them. And all they did was invite people to ridicule them. So just having advertising, throwing messages at people on social media, simply doesn't work. Similarly, um, Twitter um, employed a marketing firm to do something similar for BMX bikes. And they were trying to say that men riding bikes is more masculine, more, more, you know, more macho. Worked for men briefly in Britain, lost loads of its female following, didn't work. Yet Dell computers, well, people used to go onto Twitter to complain about Dell. So what Dell did was they, they put their repair team to do all the, all the tweets on their behalf. And it became their best service center front door than anything else. So then people who were Dell customers knew to go to Twitter, knew to engage in that way. So if you're authentic and you're really into your discipline, if you really believe in what you do, then you're more likely to get lots of followers. If you're fake and you're putting up a front to try and sell something, you very easily get found out. And the problem is major brands have had that problem as well. This is Waitrose, a supermarket in Britain. Now, you've got Harrods, you've heard of Harrods, uh, and, and Fortnum and Mason's are one-off stores. Below that, you've got Waitrose, which is a chain, Marks and Spencer's, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Aldi's, Lidl's, and others. Um, Waitrose are one of the more exclusive brands. And they thought, wouldn't it be nice to engage our customers online so they can all share why they love shopping at Waitrose, which is a bit like inviting trouble. What they did was they put a thing and said, Waitrose reasons. I like shopping at Waitrose because, and this is what you got. I like shopping at Waitrose because their swan burgers are good enough for the queen because their, their parking space is so much bigger for my 4x4. Four four. I shop at Waitrose so that people think I'm terribly rich and therefore better than they are. Um, Waitrose thought this is a disaster. And of course, all the newspapers picked up on this. However, what Waitrose did was that they, they were wise to realize it actually reinforced their brand positioning. It reinforced them as being an elite brand, which actually kind of helped them. But it wasn't really what they wanted. I suppose one of the lessons from this is that you can never really have a granular plan at the beginning. The best social media works where you have a starting point, then you listen to how people engage, and then you respond to them. And that can work incredibly well. This is why in places like Saudi Arabia, you know, I mentioned earlier on that I've been working in, in the Middle East, I learned a lot of things that aren't obvious. Some of them are counterintuitive. Um, what I learned was that a lot of the big, strong media companies that do traditional media, your cinema ads, your TV, your press, your billboards, your, your magazines, they tend to be owned by very old men. Yet the real wealthy people in media are usually dynamic young women. Why? Because women in the Middle East are the biggest consumers of luxury goods, the biggest consumers of cosmetics. So if you're Procter & Gamble and you want... Uh, to be able to communicate to young people on social networks, 
you would always pick somebody who's an expert in the subject. You wouldn't go to an advertising agency. You're better off to get somebody who really understands the product to talk on your behalf. So what you get are companies, and people like Mia Tama, who's only 27, she has 60 people working for her. She has more projects and she knows what to do with. And she's one of many young dynamic women now who are becoming really big forces in, in blogging and, and online communications through social media. And this is how brands communicate, through people that do really care and are really passionate. It happened with Dove, the campaign for real beauty, the first advertising campaign to have a URL as its strap line. Behind the scenes, once you clicked onto Dove's site, you also had psychiatrists to talk about what beauty really was. You had a real discussion about what natural beauty was. They claimed the bigger position. Um, you also have things like this. If you talk about the significance of social media done in, in the right way, then what better to say that the, the current president of the United States, the difference between him getting into power and becoming president and him not getting into power was because of social media. And you might ask why. Well, this young guy, Thomas Gensmer, um, was a young business graduate, very similar to you, who came, graduated just at the time, like now, where some interesting things were starting to happen in digital. He was also very political. He, he wore his convictions on his sleeve. And he managed to work his way to working as part of the team for Hillary Clinton at the time, for her last election bid. Before that, He'd worked with a few um, people who wanted to be regional nominees. And he worked with one guy called Sen Senator Wesley Clark. Now, Senator Wesley Clark wanted to be the first digital senator in America. So he created a website. And on all his publicity, he said, here's my email address. Here's my web address. I'm forward looking. Come and join me. Join my community. And this young guy, Thomas Gensman, was in charge of this community. Now, it didn't work out for Wesley Clark. And the day after the election, Thomas Gensmer started looking through all the reasons why the website might not have worked. And then he hit on the in tray, the inbox. And what he got when he got to the inbox were unread emails. 80,000. 80,000 unread emails. And he thought, what a disaster. They told everybody to email him. They all thought it was a great idea. But nobody in the team was responsible for responding to emails. And had they known they would have got that many and it would have crashed, um, they wouldn't have set up that, that link anyway. So he realized very quickly that you can only set up online, not your wildest ambitions, but only what you can service. Don't over-exaggerate, otherwise it will come back and bite you at some time. And his great lessons to pass on to other people is, don't create random email if it doesn't have a clear end. If you're sending out an email, Facebook page, or tweet, make sure you can absorb the responses you're getting. Now, from that disaster, he went and worked with Hillary Clinton. That was also a bit of a disaster. He ended up working with Obama, and he had 14 days to get the website together. But what they did was they created a starting point, not an end point. They created a website where people could engage, suggest things, and get involved. And what it became was a lynch point. It, it wasn't so much the $600 million it, ra it raised. It was the 13 and a half million people it got to knock on doors on election day to get people out to vote. And when the margin in America was no more than four or five million, and they got 13 and a half million people to get more people to vote, you realize that was the turning point. Huge impact. And he's since worked on the, the websites with, with um, governments in Brazil and in France. And he's still got 100% record, Tom Gensmer. Uh, but he's interesting. He, he always says the most important Obama tactic was to have digital at the core, not just reporting to comms or fundraising managers, uh, funding managers. In organizations, if the decisions are made by the technology officer, you tend to be going in the wrong direction. Um, and his punchline, of course, it always is, be realistic about what you can maintain. So I guess the conclusion of this, and where it brings us all to now, is the world that you're going to go into, it's the crucial big world of, of employment now, is that you may well have heard that a lot of, a lot of uh, the jobs involve pre-plan campaigns, big launches, uh, lots of research going on, subjective feed work, but you get paid at the beginning for it. Where now, the model is becoming increasingly about you know, a pre-planned start, iterative development, live validation, so you're making it as you go along, um, but you only get paid on results, which is a huge, big change. Um, if you look in Europe and the elections of popes, uh, in, in 2005, this was a scene outside the Vatican, the same spot a few years later, everybody had screens, everyone was recording it, everybody was capturing their own experience because they wanted to be involved and engaged. And similarly, in a short space of time, 
For you guys graduating now, the jobs out there are very different. You get brand content curators, search specialists, web branding architects. These are all the roles that are, that are emerging now. And I think um, one of the educators of the year in Britain said recently that anybody at school uh, about to enter a degree, by the time they finish their, their degree course, something like 30% of the jobs in the digital world don't exist yet. Huge change. So the best thing you can do is to stay nimble, stay fresh, rise to challenges, and don't get locked into the old ways of doing things, because you're going to need to be nimble and adapt and change so many times in your working careers. The last thing I'm going to show you, apart from all the red expertise we have at my university, we have a, a doctor of Hollywood, believe it or not, um, is, is this. Hang on. Flicking through. Won't even talk about the jars. Um, let me just show you one last thought for you to be aware of. This guy um, is interesting for a number of reasons. When we did the book Pioneers of Digital, um, we wanted to find which one person had the biggest Twitter following in the world. They did, they did all their own tweets. So we started with Aston Kircher, wasn't him. We thought, obviously, Lady Gaga then. She doesn't. She has people doing tweets on behalf of her. We went through all the film stars, wasn't them. Went through all the music stars, wasn't them. Came up with this actor. And when I did this slide, I think he had something like 5.8 million. He's got something in the region of 12 million followers now. But he does all his own tweets every day. Why? Well, he's a journalist, he's a writer, he's a broadcaster, he's been in films. He's a very clever wit, he's a fantastic short writer. But he also gets fed up of doing interviews with journalists who report what they say accurately, then he gets sold onto another paper who change it a bit to make the story interesting, who then sell it to somebody else who change it again. So by the time it goes for the fifth generation, he's insulted somebody or attacked somebody he never even mentioned. He said at least with Twitter, he can talk to people directly in an authentic way. However, if he has a bad day, and he does suffer from mental illnesses at times, if he mentions this in his tweets, then every single mental health charity wants him to be their ambassador. And the moment he mentions any change in his health, everybody's throwing things at him. He said it's a bit like being Bruce Almighty. You get, oh, everything gets overstated. Um, but he said, the only, what happened with him was that he became famous for being on Twitter because he once got stuck in the lift. And at a time where the newspapers were trying to make sense of Twitter, what they needed was a big story to attach it to. And the story was this. This famous guy got stuck in a lift on the 26th floor of a famous building in London. Famous actor, famous building, stuck in a lift with Twitter. What he did was he just tweeted, tweeted his followings and said, I'm stuck in a lift on the 26th floor of Centerpoint. Hell's teeth. I could be here for hours. Arse, poo, and whittle. Now, you can imagine such a turn of phrase made. It was really newsworthy. The story went around the world, so much so that his following went up massively. He was invited onto radio shows and TV shows. His following grew yet again. Um, but he became really significant. And you think, well, why is this important? It's important because celebrities are creating communications channels and brands like Starbucks are not far behind. 100,000 followers might not be big in broadcast terms, but it exceeds the circulations of most local daily papers. In other words, personal brands are huge. Corporate brands online are not so huge. People are interested in people, not interested in corporations. So the language about relationship marketing, people to people, kind of gets lost when you bring brands into it. And the great thing for you guys is it still hasn't been cracked yet. He'd always say, you need to be authentic. The best way to do that is to love what you do. But in practice, if you talk to all the great pioneers of digital, this is what you come down to. Um, they never let technology dictate, or te technologists, uh, techies, dictate what they do. They always challenge the existing value chains. That's what you're going to need to keep on doing. They're always authentic on social networks. They take decisions in real time. But this is a crucial one. They're not necessarily original. They just do things that people get, first of all. And once you get it, then you can start to afford the luxury of doing original things. Now, if you do that, I would hope that when I'm talking about the history of digital in future, I'll be talking about at least one or two of you in this room. There's no reason why not, because you happen to be, the, as I say, the right age, the right time, uh, to do something really significant if you really embrace the challenge and don't get sidelined by all the many things that can distract you. So I wish you good luck. I look forward to working with your university more, with my university, the University of East London, and uh, hope you won't be strangers. Look forward to seeing more of you soon. Thank you very much.
Yeah. Uh, do you have any questions to ask? Any one, two, three? Come on, guys, make it more interactive. Yes. Come on, big brag. I want to hear some good questions with some good voices. Okay, if you're not going to ask a question, I'm going to ask a question. Um, what's, what's the best bit of um, online, social media, or whatever format you choose online, what's the best bit of communication you've seen in India? I need to know because I'm still learning. So, One at a time, come on. Who? Um, hands up, go on. Best example, we'll see if we can better it. We're going to take a vote on this. So, what for you, okay, what for you, you're sitting in the wrong place. What for you is the best one that you've seen? WhatsApp, Facebook. WhatsApp, Facebook, yeah? Hands up if you think WhatsApp, Facebook's the best bit of communication. You yeah, I think you've got the majority here, okay. We don't need to go much further. Oh, star, well done that, man. Um, okay, why? What is it about that that, that makes it better? It is quite easy to use. Easy to use? Any other reasons? Fast. Fast, faster than me, okay. It's free. It's free as well, right, okay. <laughs> Paul, Paul, yeah. what about Twitter, perhaps? Do people use Twitter? Here? Yeah, what about, uh, do people use Twitter? No, 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 no. So what's that? Go on. Let's get a voice at the, let's get a voice at the back, go on, for change. What? I'm just asking the question. What what makes WhatsApp better than Twitter and the others? Because Twitter's also free. Um, one to one communication. One to one communication. Right. Okay. So it cuts out all the other stuff. Yeah. So nobody else kind of gets to see what you're saying. You can do it one to one. Right. It's, it's a really good point. Do you know um, some research that's happening? You're not going to like this, but you might as well know. Um, do you know there's a lot of research happening right now because when you use WhatsApp, you think you're doing one-to-one. -one. When you're sending people links via email, you think nobody else can see them. Well, bad news for you guys is that, they, yes, they can. Google and all the other big search networks know exactly what you're sending on links, and they call it dark social. What they're trying to do now is to figure out whether they should make that known, how they should use that for brands. Um, and there's loads of research happening right now. It's one of the big issues. Um, that are going on about what they do with that information about, about the sort of things that go on WhatsApp. But WhatsApp market themselves beautifully because they make it personal, they make it fast. It's a bit, is Snapchat popular here? Yeah, yeah right, okay. What's more popular, Snapchat or WhatsApp? <laughs> WhatsApp, right, okay, I got the message. Okay, what's that? <laughs> Good to hear your voice. You've taught me something new, so thank you for a bit of new knowledge you've given me. I very much appreciate that. Okay. So, did you have a great time? Okay. So, first of all, I want to thank our management, our director, Dr. Natu. To first, to get international speakers, it's not very easy. So I want to thank my management and the authorities on the dais to get Professor Paul and Professor Simon. Professor Paul and Professor Simon. <laughs> are professors from University of East London. You know, I appreciate that you have come all the way from UK. Two few colleges and one of, us, uh, uh, one of our college to speak to you all. Finally, I thank all you people because in spite of your busy schedule, in spite of exams next week, you have given us some valuable time. Thank you. We look forward. We look forward for a strategic tie-up with University of East London. Thank you once again.
just be seated for 2 3 minutes silence silence keep silence hello shraddha agarwal is there Ashruta Goel Sharma Saurabh What's this register Kunal Makwana is there Trupti Shetty Drumit Vitlani Bhakti Vadiya, Rachana Shet. See, they are all proxies. So we are very innovative. Indians are very good in that. <laughs> and uh, very seriously, you know, this will definitely, this kind of thing will never happen in developed countries. That is the difference between them and us. We are more intelligent. We are very innovative. We are the brightest lot in the world. What? actually puts us down every time is commitment sincerity so i don't want to give any lecture on this but actions will speak louder those who have not attended have to be punished and uh, sir will talk more into detail but which is the most difficult subject in your semester <laughs> no that is i know it is very hr is the most difficult because to practice hr is complicated look at the situation after telling you all that action will be taken still many have not come many have signed proxy signatures you are doing this service to education so action would be that i think financial management is a tough paper so those who are not here today sir will tell what to do my proposal would be to cancel their internals and make them give the internals again you are this is an example and again one proposal is deduction of 5 marks in all subjects instructions will be given to the examination department now i want our director to talk to you because what happens is that getting all these international speakers it is lot of hard work and after that if uh, there is no recognition from the students i'm not saying you i am talking about them if they don't feel it is worthwhile then it, the question comes why did you take admission in thakur institute you should have gone somewhere else because first day of orientation we have promised you value education and we stand committed nobody can create a situation where we get depressed we are so excited to give you value so that when you will get be placed in the next year you will get the best of the placement and definitely international placements so now i would request sir to add value to whatever uh, we have been talking about i'll speak yeah please please go ahead yeah most probably this is our last face to face meeting before the exam starts and few realities to be brought to your notice some students have been involved or engaged in buying internal papers just wait listen to me carefully so we have found out that one particular class itself was knowing some papers in advance and that is why we will be cancelling that examination you will come to know the new timetable 
and the exams will be taken between 15th, 16th and 17th April. I am really shocked, also feeling very ashamed that these things happen in our institute. And the first time in my institute where I have worked as a director, that students are paying money and trying to purchase internal papers, internal test papers. Very sad. So those who are guilty, we have already noted, we have called their parents. For them, punishment is going to be there. Their admissions will be cancelled. They will be losing their year. But as a class, as a whole, we will be conducting re-exam very shortly. So the timetable you will get. My suggestion is, in future, don't get anything ready-made by shortcut. You may have a little happiness. Oh, I solved my tax paper so nicely. But ultimately now what is going to happen? You have to solve another paper which will be more tougher. Just because you people have tried to buy, influence people by paying money. So remember this lesson. Ultimately all these things come up. They cannot be hidden. So don't get involved in all such things. I, right from the beginning when you joined this institute, I have told you that if there is any problem, any difficulty, you please come to me. And I am shocked to know that not a single student, not even a single CR came to me that this has happened. In today's talk, you are talking about WhatsApp. It is cheap, or rather it is free and quick and so on. The only disadvantage is this, that this technology is used in a negative manner. So at present my suggestion is, don't get involved. If you get something ready-made by shortcut, avoid it or report it to your faculty members, to the director, and don't get involved in all these dirty things. Now let's come to the exam which is going to start on third. Rule number one, you have to carry your I-card, you have to carry your hall ticket, like last semester. Have you contacted library and given your photograph? So how your uh, hall ticket will be available? And hall ticket, you have to take it on 30 and 31st March only. That is Monday and Tuesday only. So today itself, every first year student should contact the librarian and find out whether your library, uh, your hall ticket is ready. Plus you must have your genuine for original I-card ready with you. <coughs> Both these things are compulsory. You cannot use your mobile in the examination. University has given us authority to remove student, cancel his examination, not to allow to appear for the exam. Remember this. This is applicable to PG exam also, even though it is not a university exam. But the rules are applicable for both. During the exam period, on all the papers, you must be wearing proper formals. I don't want a tie, but proper formals. So jeans are not allowed, sleeveless is not allowed, and that all, everything you know, but still people come. Break the rules. Now today I find some people in black t-shirt. Jai Ho. <laughs> What's your name? Kunal, are you different from others? Have you come from moon or some other? Uh... So you meet me today before going home. I will take you to the moon. <laughs> so this is where, you know, all these things happen. There are some more students, CRs, please note. I've been always telling that follow certain de decorum discipline, but you're not following. And now we have started taking actions and actions are going to speak as Dr. Natu said. We are going to punish all those who have not come today. They have to give financial management paper again. Those who have not come today, those who are absent and proxy people also. <laughs> not being conducted. So if it will be conducted, I will make it sure that I set the paper. You have? Those who are defaulters. I am not talking about all students. They are 
डिफॉल्टर्स या एंड आई एम ओपनली नाउ यू आर ऑल अवेलेबल टेलिंग यू दैट एनी कॉपिंग केस फाउंड एनी चिट फाउंड इन द एग्जामिनेशन विथ एनी वन विल लूज यूर एम बी ए डिग्री लेट मी टेल इट वेरी क्लियरली लास्ट सेमिस्टर ऑल्सो we found people are going to lu again and again reading there and coming back and all these things nonsense <laughs> happening this should not happen with the mba students earn on your own merits you know those who do all these i call them beggars bhikari log hai wo jo is tarah se गलत बात करते हैं सो डोंट डू ऑल दिस नॉन सेंस एंड रॉन्ग थिंग्स अटेंडेंस वाइज दोज अटेंडेंस इज लेस देन सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू गिव देअर हॉल टिकेट्स वॉट एवर यू नो कितने भी रो आप कुछ भी करो यू आर नॉट सपोज टू अपियर फॉर द एग्जाम एंड your uh, sip that is summer intensive uh, intense project starts from actually 15 but now we are thinking of taking your uh, re exam of uh, some papers which were leaked those who are affected not all i am talking about that class where this has been noticed this has been found okay and those who are actually involved they will be severely punished with as i told you their admissions will be cancelled we are issuing the notice today itself so take care and complete your responsibility in time and wish you all the best